As a reminder for those of you just dialing in now, my name is Aaron McHale. I'm the oil field services analyst here at TD, and I'll be moderating the panel. I'm joined by uh, Dale Dusserhoff, CEO of Trican, and Scott Treadwell, VP Capital Markets and Strategy at Calfrac. So I'll start broad, but perhaps maybe we could kick off the panel with each of you sharing a brief update on how your businesses have been impacted by and how you're responding to COVID-19. Uh, it's an open-ended question, but maybe each of you could give us a quick rundown on what you and your teams have been up to over the past few months from an operations cost and safety perspective. So Dale, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, sure, you bet. Uh, thanks, Aaron, and thanks everyone for listening. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, safety is number one in these kind of, uh, and it's number one priority in this type of environment in particular uh, with our staff. And uh, so we implemented a number of procedures, uh, primarily around social distancing and closing our offices very early on. So <clears throat> basically in mid-March, we, we closed most of our offices. And we've had no cases of COVID in TRICAN. And, and we've implemented uh, good procedures in the field, too, that have allowed us to continue to work in the field uh, without any incidents there. And uh, we'll kind of continue on with with these going forward. Uh, we're back at work in most of our field locations uh, with uh, you know, procedures around uh, distancing and that. And uh, in Calgary, we would have about 50% of our staff back in the office, uh, sales and engineering, management's back. Uh, a lot of people would take transit we haven't had back. Uh, how have we responded? Uh, well, basically, it was a complete drop off in in work volumes when the COVID virus hit in mid-March. And uh, so we've just responded by cutting back our active fleets. Uh, we went down, we started with two fracturing fleets working in, in April. We went right down to one one fleet working in uh, May and June. Uh, got Went from 23 cement trucks down to six, uh, eight cement trucks down to basically one working in May and June again. So very low revenue uh, through, in particular, like I said, the May and June months, and and, and uh, so just had to respond on the cost side at all areas. The strategy we've taken is uh, keeping our supervisors on staff. So we've retained all of our supervisors. Uh, everyone in the company that is uh, not being laid off has taken a 20% uh, cut in pay with uh, corresponding uh, leave without absence. Uh, so they, you're basically working four days a week if you're in the office. And our, a lot of our field people have gone to a 13 and 12 days off schedule. So that's actually transfer, translates to a 25% cut in pay. And we've uh, we laid off uh, over 50% of our staff uh, on temporary layoffs. We hope to bring a lot of them back as things pick up. And in, in particular, the ones that we've laid off at a variable rate, uh, which are day rate staff, uh, in the field, we uh, basically reduced ourselves to very few day rate staff, and as I mentioned, are running our crews with all supervisors, which allows us to ramp up a lot easier. On the equipment side, uh, I talked about uh, you know what we got down to. We're now back to running three fracturing crews through Q3. Going to end up at 10 to 12 uh, cement trucks in that time frame, and uh, roughly three to four coil units. And our, our view. Our forward scope on work is that uh, we've got pretty good line of sight to keeping that equipment busy. And the key to right now is running at high utilization and keeping your costs low. And so we, we believe we can keep high utilization on that amount of equipment. And then we've basically parked all the other equipment. Uh, from a spending standpoint, uh, we, we we keep our equipment up because we can and we will. And so we've been spending on our active equipment. But anything that we park, uh, is being parked whole and we're not scavenging it. Uh, so a little cost to bring it back, but there's there might be some minor repairs in that that we'll fix when we do bring it back. And so the repair and maintenance spending is really just on the active equipment right now. And then all discretionary costs uh, cut right down uh, uh, to as low as possible. And, uh, and so it's really been about cutting our costs to match this big reduction in revenue and now making sure we keep our costs low, and in particular our fixed costs low in the second half, and getting as high utilization as possible. Got it. Same question. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. And well, thanks to TD for, for hosting and inviting us. Um, it's always nice to, to chat. Um, really, there's not much to add to, to what Dale said. I think he kind of covered all of the, the salient points. Um, 
you know, I think for us there was a slight difference between the U.S. and Canada. I think in U.S. the change was was actually quite abrupt in terms of the slowdown. Uh, Canada programs really ran through most of the end of March, and then uh, breakup programs got delayed once you got into to April. Um, from the overhead side, uh, most of the reductions were made, you know, because of lower volumes in accounting or HR or IT. Uh, we we have looked at the structure of the company, and I, and I think what we can sort of say going forward is that between structural changes and our ERP implementation, we probably won't need to add fixed costs uh, at the same rate we would have the last time we came out of a downturn. Um, in terms of I engaging with people, I think Dale kind of hit the nail on the head. We have to be sensitive to the people that work for us, to their needs. You know, childcare is a big one. Before you kind of got to the end of June, uh, people were, who worked, you know, had childcare options or their kids were in school. And as that changed, we obviously had to be cognizant of that impact. Uh, Dale mentioned transit. That's another one. Uh, and there are some people who, who just didn't feel completely comfortable coming back. And so technology was was a great enabler for us to to engage with everybody and make sure that they could do their job uh, efficiently and effectively um, without any undue stress. Um, you know, the other side of safety is probably in the field, and like Dale, we've we've really focused on the supervisory uh, side of it. You know, I think one of the, the the big hallmarks for us has always been the safety and service quality, and and actually in Q2 we did a project that was supposed to be 28 days, did it in 20 with less than 1% NPT and no recordables, and and that's proof that you know that that concentrating on the high end supervisory talent um, really does pay off. You know, obviously, when things pick up, uh, that'll that'll seed a whole bunch of crews as, as we grow again. But it's it's great to have uh, that high quality staff in in the shop today. Scott, I'm going to stick with you. Um, energy sector downturns typically result in supply attrition of oil field equipment, including pressure pumping assets. Um, so if I look at your fleet, and then maybe more broadly in the industry, obviously you guys have a, a, a bit of a different view being in Canada, U.S. and internationally. Um, like what are you seeing in terms of uh, permanent, you know, supply reductions across your various, you know, operating geographies? Yeah, um, I, I think in the U.S. it's probably a bit more pronounced. You've certainly seen a couple of the, the leading players there either uh, – make very specific quantitative an, uh, announcements about the level of reductions. You know, in the, in the case of Schlumberger, it's essentially retiring a whole bunch of equipment and then only using half of, of what's left. Um, Halliburton essentially parking anything that's not a Q10 pump uh, and, and then kind of replacing it uh, based on economics. And, and then there's been, you know, a couple of smaller players in the U.S. business that have actually left. So I think that rationalization is, is well underway. Uh, and, and bodes, you know, pretty well, I think, for when things get better. Um, I would say in Canada, and, and this would be more of a comment from us, um, you know, we certainly haven't decommissioned any material assets in Canada over the last couple of years. We've, we've chosen to move it to the U.S. Um, it does provide maybe a little more optionality in a bigger market. Um, and then, you know, certainly in Canada, for us, we've got a very high level of standardization uh, and consistency in our business. So, 95% of our active pumps in Canada today are the same configuration. They're the cat-on-cat -cat configuration. Um, we call them 2,500 horsepower. They actually have a 2,700 horsepower fluid pump on them. And so it's a very high-spec fleet that, you know, you can, you know, to Dale's point, park and reactivate at almost no cost uh, as you go forward. So in Canada, I don't think there's much legacy equipment on our side that we would be concerned about. In the U.S., there probably are some lower spec uh, pumps, and I think we'll we'll address that as we sort of see where the U.S. business plays out over the over the years to come. But from a broad perspective, I think the U.S. has has definitely been the uh, the more active in terms of retirement. But that's probably because it had a lower average quality fleet um, than Canada did. And Dale, I can appreciate that some of your answer might be the same. So maybe you could just quickly. Uh -huh touch on, on, you know, if there's any differences or anything you would add to Scott's answer. And then we could probably move to, you know, the next question. And, and that would be Canada has always been more about liquids rich and gas plays versus oil. And so could you perhaps also share some anecdotes uh, of conversations you're having with these types of customers, uh, if any, and, and are you seeing any opportunities to deploy, if they're seeing any opportunities to deploy capital in the back half of this year, or is it? still too early to tell. 
Right. So on the equipment side, uh, we did all of our attritioning last year, not all of it, but but basically we attritioned out all our, our older 13 to 16 year old pumps, which are 2250s at that point in time, and uh, sold them for about $160 a horsepower, which is what we higher than what we trade for today uh, on a per horsepower basis if you take the cementing business and everything out. So it's so decent price in the context of things. And so what we have left is uh, we have 100 and, well, 345,000 horsepower that's 2750s or 3000 horse. So those are kind of premium heavy duty pumps. And then we would have about 240,000 uh, of 2500 pumps, uh, which is similar to what Scott uh, is talking about. So 2500 motors and a little bit bigger fluid ends on them. So, uh, so that would be what we have left in our fleet. It's all, it's all workable right now. The oldest is kind of eight to 10 years old range. And so no real plans to attrition it out. Although if, you know, if we, uh, if we found another market for it uh, to kind of help tighten up the Canadian market, we would. And uh, the fleet that's going to be the most active in Q3 is our biofuel fleet. We have uh, almost 150,000, 145,000 horsepower of biofuel, so three, three to four crews of biofuels, uh, which are natural gas and diesel powered units. These units uh, are, are kind of the latest, greatest. They, the fuel consumption is pretty significant on them, and so we, our emission reduction is significant. So we've been investing quite a bit over the last couple of years in, in these fleets, and they're, in, they're the strongest in demand. In, going forward and all, all the equipment we're going to run in Q3 here will be biofuels. And then a lot of that equipment is also uh, outfitted with idle reduction technology, which all, it also allows us to reduce our emissions, which our, our clients like and we, we want to do. And so that idle reduction technology is basically is stop-start technology. The motors don't run uh, while they're idling. And oh, that's, that's the stuff that's in the highest demand here uh, for the next little while. And then uh, in, re in response to what we're seeing in the market, uh, the price of gas is probably double what most of our clients have forecasted it would be this, this summer and certainly much, much higher than last year. And with condensate uh, tracking WTI and the differential on condensate being very low, uh, the read I, I get talking to our clients is that liquids rich gas plays are economical in terms of cash flow, and so they're, ca they're positive cash flow plays. Uh, there's a few clients that are are keeping their programs intact and spending money on these plays in the second half. Uh, no one's really increased yet, uh, but I would say the majority of our clients are still, uh, they're cash flow positive, but they're not willing to start drilling yet until they get just more assuredness that, uh, that what we see is going to stay. Uh, a lot of them are, you know, they're going through banking redeterminations, and so they're watching their credit facilities. Uh, but mainly, they just want to see if there's some stability. We've got a second wave of COVID running through. Our crude price is going to hold, which translates to condensate prices. Our natural gas price is going to hold. Uh, or are they going to increase during the winter, which a lot of our clients believe. And so there's a level of optimism. There's quite a few more inquiries than we would have had a month ago with customers looking at doing work, but at the moment I wouldn't say anyone's starting to schedule stuff into the board until possibly September. There's a, there's a few clients that are maybe looking at September uh, additions to their programs. Scott, any, anything there to add on the, um, on the natural gas liquids clients or, or, or just on your client mix in general? Yeah, maybe to a little bit. I would say, you know, we characterize some of the conversations as, as being fueled by curiosity. I think in the early days of the oil correction, there was a view that uh, dry gas could be a huge beneficiary, um, but you've seen the backup of LNG into North America, and so that that's kind of gone away. But there was er certainly some curiosity around looking at some of the drier gas plays or what could you do with condensate. Um, you know, we've, we've got a proprietary process on uh, using that in, in fracturing fluids. And so there's, there's lots you can do there, but I would say it was more curiosity and tire kicking. I'd, I'd echo Dale's points that there, isn't, there wasn't a lot of uh, stuff getting booked. Uh, I would say caution's the overriding theme from our producer base, and you know I think they've got to thread a pretty delicate needle. They've 
certainly got to generate positive cash flow and and ideally good returns but you know they've got to keep barrels in their credit facility so their their 1p barrels need to stay at a relatively high level uh, and if they're producing them obviously those have declines they may have midstream or land retention commitments and so I think there's some competing uh, drivers in in their capital budgeting decisions and I would say echo I would echo Dale's comments that as you get into September uh, there seems to be more uh, discussion around what the last part of the year looks like maybe setting up for some producers to have a uh, a good start to 2021 but uh, it's it's kind of weeks and months away at this point uh, than more than anything else um, obviously between the two of you and, and focusing on the Canadian market uh, you two com uh, command a sizable market share uh, collectively uh, on that same vein pressure pumping has been oversupplied for quite some time and I know each of you focused on you know controlling costs over the last several years but can you maybe comment as, as you start to have those conversations with your customers, uh, comment on the current pricing environment, what it's like, and um, my, my assumption is there's, there's not a whole lot to give on that end, but uh, as you try to balance both maintaining you know, rational business fundamentals and, and uh, customer, base, customer base that's equally distressed, I guess, what's your, what's your overarching strategy as you, as you engage with those customers? And maybe, Scott, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I think it might be a stretch to say that our customers are as distressed as the service space. I think um, you know you, you mentioned it that you know we've we've got customers that are making cash flow at the wellhead, and there's some pricing out there today that is indicative of essentially little to no field margin and, and a negative EBITDA and an, and a more negative operating cash flow. So um, I think the the balance is is firmly with the producers that doesn't mean that we don't understand how their business has changed um, but I think the reality is um, they have and continue to benefit from where pricing is today and it's it's times I guess like this the distress times that you know you need to walk the walk um, you know we've seen irrational pricing in the past in all the markets we operate in and a lot of times it's due to pumper specific utilization issues whether that's you know losing a client or losing specific programs you know there'll be a, a response and and that continues and probably will always continue um, I would say there isn't the level of panic in Canada that you see in some of the US basins where guys have gone to you know essentially zero spreads working uh, in, in some of their bigger basins and so obviously that that does uh, ferment a bit of panic um, we do believe the pricing should be better in Canada because of the structural uh, consolidated nature of the business. Uh, you know, most of the U.S. players, they, they've got a, you know, an okay customer list and they, they tend to stick to their knitting in that regard. Um, and there may be some changes with, with those guys. You know, we talked about the, uh, the capital rationality that's come into some of the North American pressure pumping maybe a little too early to tell how that impacts Canada um, but you know certainly I would say we're probably a little more optimistic about how pricing trends in Canada um, certainly from the supply side and then really it's now just about uh, you know to your point we've fixed the cost side as best we can and, and you just have to wait for utilization to get better and you're right there's 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 no way to incentivize utilization um, in this kind of market because you've uh, you know, you've got people to pay and you've got costs to bear and, and there's just no fat left in the system. Dale, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll get you to touch on that as well quickly and, and obviously I know the, the answer might be a bit repetitive. Uh, so maybe you could also answer, you know, the balance sheet's in pretty good shape. Um, so you're also working on preserving liquidity and financial flexibility, but maybe you could tell us how you're thinking about capital allocation in a recovery scenario as well. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I kind of alluded to it earlier, there's kind of two things that that drive profitability in this environment. One is keep the utilization as high as possible, and the other is keep your costs as low, in particular fixed costs as low as possible. And if you can do that, uh, you can eke out a little bit of positive cash. Uh, from, a, from a utilization standpoint, we're pretty focused on, there's two things. One is crew utilization in a month. So, you know, driving, driving uh, you know, greater than 25 days a month of pumping days in a month. Uh, but the other one is, and Scott alluded to it as well, is uh, pumping hours per day. And so we're pushing our, our clients, working with our clients to get up into the 20 to 22 hours of pumping hours per day, which if we can be in that range, that's good profitability for ourselves and for our clients. It saves them money.
I think Scott said they saved eight days on a pad. Well, that's similar to what we could do if you're running in that range. And so that's where a lot of the savings can come from for our clients. They'll save a lot more by being out there eight days less than they will on, on pricing usually. And so uh, so that's a focus for us, and that's, uh, that's certainly something that we're willing to pass on and sh maybe share is the right word uh, because it helps our economics as well with our clients. Uh, on the pricing side, uh, we're trying to hold pricing and have been able to so far. There's, there's the odd crazy bid in Canada um, that does come out. It's, it's for smaller clients on kind of one-off basis or small pads or something that we've seen, but we're, just, we're not going to chase that down. We, we're not working below, uh, re, you know, basically covering our, our capital, capital costs uh, uh, that it takes to run crews and that, so we have to be cash flow positive, including all costs in. And uh, that's why bother otherwise. And so we've been, we've been able to, to do that, and uh, we'll, just, we'll just keep that discipline. Uh, luckily, our clients uh, have been supportive of keeping a healthy service industry in Canada. And I think all of us, CalFrac ourselves, have clients that think that way. There's a few clients out there, of course, that just want to bid things. But that, that client base has been good for ensuring that they're, you know, we'll pass on cost savings we may have uh, through biofuels and running natural gas, uh, things like that. But uh, we don't have to pass on all of our margins. Uh, so that's been good. And then on the other side, it's, uh, we can improve our margins by you know, reduced R&M. We've got a big automation project that we've had ongoing all year where we collect data uh, on all of our pumps. We're down to collecting per piston data on a pump, which saves us quite a bit of money because we can just reduce the amount of time it takes to service that pump, uh, as well as predict when it's going to fail, all those kind of things. And so that's reduced costs for us. So those, those are big cost savings that we've been able to keep. And so that's, that's something that's a big focus for us. Uh, reducing uh, people on location through automation is another area where we've ha had some success. And, and so it, the moral of the story is we can save our clients some money without having to give up all our margin. And that, as long as we're able to do that, there, it hasn't been as bad in Canada, I'm saying, that, uh, than in what it was maybe in previous cycles, probably because we're as low as we can go. And uh, on the balance sheet side of it, yeah, we do have a good balance sheet. Uh, we're pretty conscious of not wrecking it. And so everything that we look at as kind of two aspects to it has to strategically fit with us. And it has to be the right price, of course. And the right price is not paying a whole bunch more uh, than what we're trading at if we're you know, if, if we got to pay three times uh, the dollars per horsepower of what we're trading at, we're better off buying our own shares. And that's been our strategy for a number of years, been very disciplined in that approach and looked at a lot of things, but always kind of back off. And so uh, strategically, I mean, consolidation would be good for our industry, but it's it's difficult to do in a, in a five competitor industry. Uh, and, and you know, we're not going to stress our balance sheet to do anything, so that, that always uh, makes it difficult as well. And, uh, and from a dollar standpoint, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at everything, kind of compare it to the buyback, and see what makes sense. Okay, and then uh, the we're, is, we're well over. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. No, the only other key is we won't stress the balance sheet to do it. So. Gotcha. Well, we're well over on our time, so so we should probably leave it there. Dale and Scott, thank you very much uh, for participating in our conference. And that's a wrap for the oil field services sectors panel. So thanks for dialing in. Take care. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, TD. Have a great day.